Good morning. I'm Judy Terzotis, president and publisher of the Times-Picayune, The Advocate, and The Acadiana Advocate. And welcome to the Fall Economic Outlook series. Everywhere you go, it seems people are talking about the economy and how it's impacting their daily lives. Today's panel will cover those topics that are front of mind for all of us as we look forward to the holiday season and 2023. Thank you for watching. Good morning. My name is Jerry DiColo, and I'm the Metro Editor at the Times-Picayune. Thank you for joining us at today's Times-Picayune Fall Economic Outlook Summit. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor, AARP. We'll be showing a short video from them now. AARP is the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people to choose how they live as they age. We work to strengthen communities and advocate for what matters most to families with a focus on health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. Here in Louisiana, we know inflation and the rising cost of insurance, electricity, and gas have hit your pocketbook hard. That's why we're pleased to sponsor today's Economic Summit with The Advocate. Having information about the current economic climate and what's to come is important for families and businesses to protect their finances and plan for the future. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion and connect with us online at aarp.org for more ways to protect your money. Before introducing our panelists today, I'd like to bring on my co-moderator, Stephanie Regal. Good morning. Thanks, Jerry. Happy to be here. Stephanie is a business reporter at the Times Picayune. She joined us this month after a long career in business journalism in Louisiana, and she is also the writer of the NOLA Business Insider Newsletter, which is our daily look at the top business stories in the region. And you can sign up for that at nola.com slash business. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce uh, Antigue Landis, who is the CEO of Landis Construction. Uh, it was a family-run construction firm responsible for some of the largest projects in the New Orleans area, including schools, housing, and the recently completed Linear Park that fronts the Ernest N. Morial Convention Center. As a third-generation leader of Landis, Antigua is in charge of overall strategy, administration, and finance for the company. Thanks, Antigua. Good morning. Uh, Dr. James Ammons is the chancellor of Southern University at New Orleans, having been appointed to the position in 2021. A native Floridian, he is a graduate of Florida A&M University and earned his PhD in government from Florida State University. Dr. Ammons has more than 25 years of experience in college administration, serving as the chancellor of North Carolina Central University and the president of Florida A&M until retiring from that position in 2012. He then became executive vice chancellor of Southern University in Baton Rouge before taking the role in New Orleans. Welcome, Dr. Ammons. David Piscola is the general manager of the Hilton New Orleans Riverside Hotel. He is a 30 plus year industry veteran, having worked for the Hilton Hotels Corporation since 1993, holding numerous roles, including general manager of the Capitol Hilton and the Hilton Atlanta Airport. Having graduated from the Culinary Institute of America, he came up through the ranks of the food and beverage industry. He, ho he serves on the boards of New Orleans and Company, the Louisiana Hotel and Lodging Association, and is the current president of the Greater New Orleans Hotel and Lodging Association. Thanks for joining us, David. And, Thank you for having uh, me. Good morning. And Lynette White Cullen. Lynette is a senior vice president of small business growth at the New Orleans Business Alliance, where she leads the organization's efforts to, to help local and small businesses. Ms. White Cullen develops tools, resources, and targeted initiatives aimed at alleviating barriers to business growth. She's active both locally and nationally in small business policy pursuits toward equitable outcomes for underrepresented founders. Ms. White Cullen's efforts have delivered over $5 million towards the organization's programs. Thank you, Lynette, for joining us today. Thank you, Jerry. So David, I'd like to start with you. Uh, summer is nearly over, though it doesn't always feel like it in New Orleans. Um, we have Knockwood had a mild hurricane season so far. Uh, and football, fall festivals are coming back, conventions are coming back, other events are returning to the city. So um, I'll open this with a fairly wide question. Uh, what's the outlook for hospitality and hotels looking like over the next year? Um, are we starting to near what we saw before the pandemic? How does, what's the lay of the land that you've been seeing? 
Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question. I, I think clearly the year started off with some headwinds as we experienced the Omicron uh, really surge, uh, which really held up the first quarter. So projections by uh, Smith Travel Research, which is an industry kind of barometer, shows through July, the city of New Orleans to be off of a normal year, and we use normal as 2019, by about 11%. But that has been ramping up aggressively. So as an example, this hotel, Hilton New Orleans Riverside, we're showing to be 104% of normal for the fourth quarter. So we're very much accelerating into a more normalized uh, trend of business. And what we saw at the beginning stages of the recovery from the pandemic was more what we call leisure pleasure guests. People that are just looking to get out of their houses, uh, escape the lockdowns and come to a great city like New Orleans and blow off some steam. But really the, the, what's the economic engine of the hospitality and tourism industry is meetings and conventions. And those meetings and conventions are what we're really seeing now. In fact, we have two uh, conventions here in the hotel now, one at the convention center, uh, large shows. Um, we're really seeing as we look into projections for 2023, nationally, um, we're expecting to be uh, uh, basically normal uh, for 2023. And, and New Orleans will lag just slightly behind that, showing an increase of about 10% uh, year over year, 22 into 23. So I, I think what we're seeing is demand is a little bit lower than previous years, meaning our occupancy levels will be a little bit off, but ADR, average daily rate, uh, we're seeing a strong acceleration, uh, some of that due to inflationary pressures. And so a key indicator for our industry is RevPAR, revenue per available room, and 2023 should exceed uh, 2019 levels. So all in all, we're really getting back to more normalized levels of business. It's great to hear. Um, Dr. Ammons, I'll, I'll ask you the next uh, question related to uh, recovery from the pandemic. Um, you know, higher education was one of the areas that was really tested over the past two years with going virtual and then trying to bring students back to campus safely. So kids are back um, at this point. Um, are things back to normal on campus? Um, and, and what does that normal look like now? Well, Jerry, first of all, thank you for uh, having me uh, on the show. Um, we are so happy that we're able to bring our students back to the campus. Our classes are in person. Our student activities are back in person. Uh, we have a very attracted Lyceum series that we'll be presenting um, this year with uh, national and global speakers coming to the campus, dance troops, artists, uh, et cetera. Uh, and it is, it, it's the campus life is back. Uh, and, you know, I think about those students who graduated uh, last spring and the spring before uh, they had some very important years of their college experience taken away from them because of COVID. Uh, but the students uh, who came to the university this year, and by the way, our enrollment is up a bit, uh, which we are uh, very excited about. Uh, we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a 30% increase in our freshman class. Uh, but the other thing that we've seen is that there is a greater demand for on-campus housing. And I'm thinking that it could be because of the impact of the pandemic where students were at, at home, uh, they couldn't socialize uh, as they could pre-pandemic. And this year we have um, uh, a surge in demand for housing. We're having to, um, prepare uh, additional rooms. Um, and, uh, initially, we had to put a uh, few students in hotels because of the demand, but it is a very vibrant uh, campus now uh, with the students being back. And in addition to that, we have a new nursing program, uh, which brought additional students uh, to the campus. So uh, it is back 
uh, as it was uh, pre-pandemic. That's great to hear. Lynette, um, I'd love to, I'd love if you could tell me some of the questions that you're getting most often from small businesses that um, are seeking um, help or support or advice from uh, the NOLA Business Alliance. What, what are the, what are the top things that they're, that they're looking for right now? What are the, what are they facing right now? So right now, a lot of our small businesses are facing labor shortages, you know, as most businesses around the country are as well. Um, access to capital is still a huge issue, especially for minority business owners. Um, getting businesses back to offices uh, has been, you know, something that they're struggling with. You know, people for the last three years have been working from home and that's worked for a lot of workers and, you know, trying to bring people back to the office has, you know, been kind of an issue. Um, supply chain is also, you know, still an issue. Um, so, you know, we are a town of small businesses and, you know, at the Business Alliance, we certainly look for, um, resources, um, that will solve some of those issues that small businesses are having. Antigua, um, I am, I am curious, um, one of the things that we have heard about, and uh, a lot of us have experienced it as well, um, after Ida and rebuilding after Ida, um, but just generally speaking, the increases in material costs, whether it was lumber or cement or what have you, and um, then the increases, and then of course the, the drop-offs, and really just kind of a wild ride recently. And I'm I'm curious how that has impacted um, y'all's business and the and the industry generally. Is that slowed down projects? Has it changed how your bidding processes work um, when you're dealing with those those shifts in commodity prices? Yeah, so it has changed our projects in that um, the pace of getting a project from it first being introduced to the market as an opportunity to it beginning construction has gotten longer and longer. And part of that is because um, people are hopeful that material prices will come down enough to equate to a reduced um, cost of construction. And that's just not been the case. And so part of that is because the material prices that people are seeing are the raw material prices. And so those things still have to be processed. They still have to be built into equipment and that takes labor, which has gone up and will not come back down. So um, anecdotally, there was a, a project, about an eight and a half million dollar project last time it was priced, which was last month, um, which was the exact same project that was publicly bid, meaning it's going for a, a low dollar bid last November um, when it was seven and a half million dollars as a low bid, which was a reduced amount of work from the project when it was first bid in March of last year, when it was um, somewhere between five and six, maybe five and a half and six and a half. So we're unfortunately like we're not seeing um, we're seeing stabilization. We're not seeing a reduction in the cost of construction that people keep hoping to see. So the, the enemy of projects continues to be time. Um, the sooner we can get something to market, the better. And the subcontractor market, the trade contractors, um, the electricians, the mill workers, uh, the mechanical subcontractors, they are getting fatigued by pricing things over and over again. And so um, that has its impact in terms of competitiveness on subsequent pricing exercises for our clients. Um, so we're working closely with our clients to try to you know, maximize the opportunity. They need to know the, the price as soon as possible of what it is they're investing in, but balancing that with the realities of the market and wanting to long-term have what's best for the project, not just at the first of, of five pricing iterations, for instance. There are so many, you know, there's so much intersection of, of, of what you all are talking about and so many stressors right now in the economy that I know you all are feeling. But um, I want to go back, David, to one thing that you talked about, because it, it really does sound like a, a very bright spot in your sector. And, and last year, you know, the city had predicted a full return in 23 or, or maybe not even until 2024. What do you think it was that, that made that estimate really too conservative? 
Gosh, I, I think perhaps there was just the uncertainty, the uncertainty of, of, of what COVID really would, would bring and how the, uh, the various um, governmental lockdowns and, and, and necessary actions that were taken were going to hold back uh, the return of, of travel. And, you know, I've heard time and time again, whether it would be 9-11 or various economic turndowns where travel was dead and people were not going to travel again. We certainly heard that coming out of COVID and that's just not the case. And particularly in the meeting environment, you can't replace, and it's great, we're, we're on a call now and we're doing our, our Zoom, but you can't replace uh, personal connections and, and our businesses is based upon those personal connections. So whether you're in a medical field or technology or whatever it is, people still feel the need to meet and to travel and to do business. And so um, the predictors of, of uh, you know, a failure to return to business until 25, 26 was just incorrect. And it's come back, it's really come roaring back as I think people are starting to switch. The economic indicators are showing that people are switching from um, buying things, which they were doing during COVID uh, to going back to buying experiences. And that's seeing, uh, you know, it's showing in travel restaurants and various other things. There's really a return to normalize uh, purchasing uh, um, processes by, by consumers. And so I think that's in large part why we're returning to normal faster than we had predicted. Let's hope it, it continues. I, I think to keep it on that trajectory and something y'all all touched on is, is the labor shortage and uh, and and the stressors there lynette can you drill down a little bit because i think that's something probably y'all all could could talk about especially in the small business sector which supports the hospitality industry right i mean what what can you all do what are you hearing from those small businesses is the is the reason they can't get people back yeah i think a lot of people especially in lower wages lower wage jobs you know have move to other industries. You know, we are big in hospitality um, and traditionally um, those are lower wage jobs and people are trying to move on to something, you know, like during the pandemic when, you know, we had to shut down, people lost their jobs, right? And so right now wages are higher. Um, small businesses are struggling because they do have to pay higher wages, you know, inflation and things that and talked about um, supplies are, are, you know, much more expensive for them now. Um, so many of the struggles, you know, are that um, and that they are having to pay more um, to workers and it's harder to find workers, um, especially in some of the hospitality industries and even in um, construction that Ann touched on. Um, we had a hurricane here. And so, you know, you've got so many um, contractors are, are still, you know, rebuilding homes um, in addition to construction projects that were already going on. Um, so, you know, a lot of industries are really feeling it now with trying to find, um, you know, um, labor. Uh, Lynette, um, are there small businesses that have been able to um, raise prices to the extent they need to, to pay those higher wages? Are there particular sectors where that, that pricing ability has been better than others? Um, I mean, because we've all felt it, right? If you go to a restaurant, it's costing yeah. you more for um, a night out. Um, you know, I guess the idea of knowing that, you know, if that's going towards wages, I mean, it makes sense, right? Um, I'm just curious if there's places where that's been easier or that's been harder when you deal with your small business clients. Yeah, I mean, in the food industry, I think, you know, in New Orleans, we all know that it's costing us more to 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 eat. Um, and some of the professional services industries, they are able, you know, to raise prices because, you know, what they charge is directly related to what they're pay paying for supplies. Um, and so in that realm, you know, they've been able to, you know, stay break even or, or stay where they were, um, you know, and that's accounting, that's accounting and, uh, legal and those types of um, right. things. Okay. Yeah. Right. So they've been able, you know, to, you know, sort of keep up with, with market rates. Um, you know, but then when you look at some of the smaller businesses, especially, you know, if, if they're in disinvested neighborhoods where people really can't afford, you know, to pay, uh, more for items and, and food and things like that, um, they are struggling more because they're seeing, they're not having, you know, the customer bases that they had before because people just don't have the income levels to pay, you know, more for the things that they were paying for. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and Antigua, you know, before this call, you and I had talked a little bit about um, the issues with finding, um, you know, finding folks in the trades. Um, you know, I'd be curious, I think you had said you've been doing some work there, um, you know, in terms of trying to bring a, a, a broader swath of people into these industries. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, what y'all are working on. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the problem for construction has been is perception rather. And so, you know, there's been this idea for decades now that success comes from a four year college education, and that doesn't have to be true. And also there's been this picture painted of what a construction worker looks like. And that is a man, um, most basically. And so there's a lot of attention right now in the construction industry to look at the untapped demographic of women and um, their unique skill sets that actually do lend themselves really well to construction. So construction is not all about brawn. There's a lot of quality control and women tend to be really, really good at that. And partnering people together to, to balance their skill set is important. And one thing too that I've learned, um, or I guess it made sense, but was brought to my attention recently was the construction trades are a space in which um, the gender wage gap is much, much diminished. So there is less of a gender wage gap in the trades than, than almost any other entry level and skilled trade type of position. And so there's a huge opportunity, and especially in a community like ours, where there are a lot of single mom households, um, it's a great way to bring new opportunity to our New Orleans families and bring stable employment and help at our industry all at once. So we're both focusing there and focusing a lot on the young people. You know, career counselors don't think of construction for um, their, what they see as higher potential students. There's a ton of math, there's engineering. Um, there are also all the services that provide for construction such as accounting and marketing and all those things. And so I think we have a lot of opportunity to build interest in their for workforce in the construction industry, but we need a lot more workers um, nationally in the coming years. Construction spending is up. It's not really foreseen as, as slowing down, at least not for a while. Um, so it's, it's a good, good spot for people to look. I know there's been a lot of effort in recent years, like at the state level and within the community and technical college system to try to steer students and, and women, like you say, to, to your sector and even preparing high school kids, right, to take that path. Uh, Chancellor, are y'all doing anything at SUNO, for instance, to partner with the construction industry and prepare students for you know, working in the trades. I know, for instance, and want to touch on also what you all did with to stand up your nursing program during the pandemic, which is a, a perfect example of, you know, helping fill the need and the, and the supply, right, um, with your students. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, I would certainly like to uh, invite Ann and, and all of the uh, business reps to our uh, business summit that will be held on our campus on September 28th. We are inviting the uh, business community to the campus to reintroduce SUNO, our students and our academic programs, and to see those places where there can be a match between the needs of business and industry in the New Orleans region and the talent that we are producing. While we don't have uh, a program in construction or construction engineering, we do have programs that uh, Ann mentioned uh, in areas that are supportive of construction. Uh, so there are uh, opportunities for um, companies to partner uh, with SUNO. The other thing that I would mention too, uh, you mentioned uh, trades. Uh, normally those uh, types of programs, workforce development programs are limited to the community and technical colleges. Uh, so at the four-year institutions, um, our programs at the baccalaureate, masters and doctoral levels. Uh, but again, we are responding 
to the demands uh, in the community. Um, you know, during the pandemic, you talk about the impact of the pandemic. We watched as uh, healthcare workers, especially nurses, were dealing with the pandemic prior to vaccines, and many of them decided that they would leave uh, the profession. And we saw that as an opportunity uh, at SUNO. And so we, uh, we didn't have any nursing expertise on the campus, so we hired a consultant to come in, develop a compelling proposal that went through all of the stages of approval within a year and a half. And this semester, just three weeks ago, we brought in our first class uh, of nursing students. There are other areas in technology like cybersecurity. We're getting ready to propose a program in cybersecurity uh, to meet the demand that we have in that area. And so we want to listen to our business partners in this community and hear the needs, the gaps that we may have in our programs, how we can uh, enhance curricula across the university to prepare students for the opportunities that are right here in New Orleans. Because when we take a look at our student profile, about 85% of our students are from the New Orleans region. And the students who graduate from SUNO tend to stay in this community. And so we have a wonderful opportunity through this dialogue and the dialogue that we're gonna have on September 28th uh, to talk about the needs and how SUNO can respond to them. And that's that's such a great example of, of you know, being able to meet the demand, right, for nursing. Do you see higher education institutions being able to pivot more quickly in the future? Because I think to be viable and remain relevant, that's something they're, they're going to have to be able to do, right? We don't have a choice. Uh, you know, the, the world changes so quickly now. Uh, and one of the things that we recognize is that we're educating students today for careers that haven't been named or created yet. And so we have to have the kind of talent uh, in our faculty and the uh, desire to build these relationships with business and industry so that we can hear about the emerging opportunities for them and also how we can incorporate those new concepts and new ideas into uh, curricula across the university. But again, we have no choice. We have to be able to pivot and provide the talent uh, that our business partners need in order for them to remain competitive. Well, uh, pivoting is oftentimes uh, not seen as something big institutions do, but startups are doing or small businesses are doing because they have, they're have they a little bit nimbler and can move more quickly. Um, it's interesting, Dr. Amos, to, sort of hear, to start hearing how, how the pandemic has helped y'all to think that way or to accelerate that type of thinking. Um, Lynette, I'd, I'd ask you um, uh, something similar in, in that regard. You know, one of the things that you said earlier was um, access to capital for small businesses, um, which only gets harder as interest rates start moving higher, um, which they are going to continue to do. Um, and so I'm curious if there are examples or if you have um, places where small businesses can go um, for alternative sources of capital um, or interesting ways that you've seen, um, you've seen small businesses raise the funds they need to raise uh, to keep growing their business or to sustain their business? Yes, yes, ab absolutely. Um, so we uh, run a program called Invest NOLA. Uh, one of the gaps that we saw in the city was that there are some high growth businesses, usually in the non-tech space, you know, that are owned by people of color. Um, and we built an ecosystem of resources to help those businesses to accelerate scale because they have such high growth potential. Um, and one of the big things was we can help them to develop strategies, you know, to grow. 
Uh, we can teach them through a management education program that we run with Tulane University. We've been connecting them to contract opportunities, working with the private sector and the public sector. Um, and then the biggest thing has been, okay, so now they need the capital to move these things forward. Um, so one of the things that we did was we um, pulled together three of the local CDFIs here, Community Development Financial Institutions. And these are institutions that are certified by the U.S. Treasury Department um, to focus on underserved communities, people who are not served by traditional banking resources. And so with these three CDFIs, um, the first thing was getting them all together would de-risk any one of them taking on a big loan. So they're now able to partner together and do loans together. Um, secondly, we actually raised $1.5 million as a loan loss reserve so that each of those CDFIs would have you know, a, a backup should some of the, the riskier loans that they're doing you know, would, would not um, pan out. Um, and then thirdly, we were able to, uh, we submitted a proposal to list the local um, initiative support corporation to their national entrepreneurs of color fund um, to get our CDFIs access to that national fund. So what that does is it helps to build capacity in these smaller uh, financial institutions, but it also puts a lot more money on the ground. So our small businesses have more access to more money um, that will help them to, you know, see those growth strategies that they develop to fruition. Um, you know, in addition, uh, NOLA BA, we've been looking for ways to develop a community uh, development fund so that where there are gaps, um, where businesses can't get enough money, we'll be able to fill those gaps. Where there, there are projects in, you know, some of our uh, seven disinvested neighborhoods that we work in, um, you know, where there are gaps in the capital stack and that we'll be able to fill those gaps. So, you know, we're looking for more innovative and creative ways to fund businesses. You know, the CDFIs have really stepped up, you know, they're funding startups that are usually very difficult for traditional banks to fund. Uh, they're finding ways to uh, deliver more patient capital to businesses you know, giving them a six month window before they have to pay. Sometimes there's a, a small percentage of the loan that's forgiven um, and, you know, looking for alternative methods uh, for them to pay. So there is money, um, you know, out there and, you know, we are helping to connect small business owners to um, some of that capital. What, what's the average loan size? About fifty thousand dollars. I'm sorry. About fifty thousand dollars is the average loan size, and of course, some of the the more um, progressive businesses that we work with, they need more capital than that. You know, because some of the strategies that we're helping them to grow um, are you know outside of what's normally you know the the usual how to get a few more customers. We're teaching them how to go out and build and you know purchase another business a whole book of business so they can bring on a whole nother industry. You know, um, we've got some construction contractors who were electrical and wiring suppliers, you know, came through our program and identified traffic control systems as a means to grow. And so now they're supplying traffic control systems to Orleans Parish, to Jefferson Parish. They just got a contract with a huge a project in Baltimore, one of the largest uh, transportation projects in Baltimore. Um, and so that's the way that we've been helping them to grow their businesses, but also we're helping them to find the capital so that, you know, they could mobilize these projects, um, you know, to grow the businesses, ultimately creating jobs for local residents. There's such an important, an important issue, Lynette, and, and I would love to drill down more into that. But I think one thing that, that it's important to ask all of y'all, and especially David, um, because sort of an issue that over touches everybody, overrides everything, is the crime in this city. And it's kind of all you hear people talking about. Are you hearing the visitors talk about that, David? Is it impacting tourism? Or, or, and, and what do you tell the people who come and stay at your hotel? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, crime, particularly in major urban environments, we've, we've seen an uptick of it over the course of the several years. Um, you know, that's an issue that that has local solutions and we need to work and advocate with our uh, our, our governmental leaders to really push that forward. I, I, I think as an industry, we do what we can to uh, supplement and support um, uh, those initiatives. As an example, 
um, the, we were advocates for passing of the quarter for the quarter, which was a sales tax initiative in the French Quarter. Uh, that money goes towards the FQMD, French Quarter Management District, to help supply uh, supplemental policing, That's post-certified officers doing additional policing of the quarter. New Orleans and Company, which I'm a board member of, we stepped up as well and said we need to we need to do more to provide a, additional security in our major business corridors. And so we've pr provided six hundred thousand dollars in funding. Again, post-certified officers, bringing more officers to have more officers on the street, helps support uh, the NOPD. We've also supplied eight. Uh, vehicles so those tours, those officers can be more effective in moving about the quarter with special, as you may have seen, small electric vehicles called Chevy Volts. They're kind of tiny little cars that get around the quarter really quickly and easily. Um, the DDD, the Downtown Development District, has always provided supplemental security, but we've doubled down on that. Um, the New Orleans, uh, Hilton Riverside, we're the, perhaps the largest taxpayer into the DDD. You may have seen recently the DDD has added another million dollars in funding to also provide support. And, and I think a, a lot of that's been done, not so much out of fear and, um, and, and concern, but really we need to make sure we're making our, our travelers and our employees as well, quite frankly, feel comfortable in moving about the city by providing that supplemental policing. And so it's, it's absolutely a critical issue uh, we're dealing with some of the uh, other what I would call quality of life issues that also lead to perceptions. And so that could be graffiti or homelessness. And so working with homeless advocacy groups, um, working with the NOLA Coalition, we're a member of the NOLA Coalition, which is advocating for a two-pronged approach really in supporting quality of life. One is uh, supporting the police directly, NOPD, with supplemental funding and support for recruitment and retention but also providing supplemental funding for some of the causations of crime, um, poverty and other issues that we see in the city, really supporting youth services to giving the youth of our city an alternative uh, and hope for the future. And so I think as an industry, we recognize that um, we need to provide safe and a clean city for travelers to feel comfortable to, and we're gonna support all those efforts. Uh, frankly, I, I, in, in my judgment, what we're seeing now is transitory, that that the effects that we're all experiencing in all the neighborhoods of New Orleans really uh, is going to be like a pendulum. And we're starting to see that swing backwards. Um, and so I feel positive for the future. Uh, I think the power of our city as a destination, we really do punch above our weight. And so we're going to continue to see travelers that want to come here. I'll use as an example, we just had a wonderful uh, kickoff classic hosting FSU and LSU in the city, and the city just performed great. It was just an amazing experience and, of course, had a positive economic impact, filling up our hotels and restaurants as well. So I feel good, quite frankly, about the future because the entire city is pulling together to fight this issue. And, and hopefully will be successful, I guess. But Anne, Lynette, Chancellor, if I could open it up to y'all, are, are you all hearing from your... Um, from your clients, from your employees, from your students? Is crime impacting the way they do business? Is it forcing them to change the way they do things? What What are you hearing and feeling? Crime is a big issue um, uh, for the university. Uh, and so one of the things that we have done in response to our environment is that we have created this vision for SUNO to be a leading urban university. And one of the challenges that New Orleans and almost every major urban center has across this country is crime. And so we are partnering with the uh, city of New Orleans uh, one thing that we've done is that we've created a grief and trauma center in our School of Social Work uh, under the leadership of Dr. Torin Sanders and Dean Rebecca Chason, um, where we are training uh, our social work students in this area of grief and trauma. We're also partnering with the NOPD. Uh, we have a growing criminal justice program and we have uh, created two programs online so that officers or prospective officers 
who want to pursue a degree and get the education or background that they need to be effective. They don't have to interrupt their lives in order to uh, attain those degrees. So we have a bachelor's and a master's that we are offering uh, online. And we're working to try and graduate more and more students from this program, as well as from some of our other programs like forensic science. Uh, we have the only program in forensic science in the state, our psychology program, our social work program. All of these programs have been uh, included in a memorandum of understanding that we have with the city of New Orleans. And just um, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted Sheriff Hudson and her team on the campus so that we could hear from them the kind of issues that they're being confronted with and how our faculty, our students and our academic programs can assist them as well. But I wanna go back to the impact of crime. Um, we're located in uh, Pontchartrain Park, uh, New Orleans East, and we have had to beef up uh, the presence of our campus uh, police department uh, in order to keep our students safe. There have also been at least a couple of instances where uh, we were recruiting faculty and our top candidates uh, would not accept the job because of the crime in New Orleans. And so it is an issue, but it's gonna take all of us using all of the resources that we have at our fingertips to do a better job of educating our young. We're gonna be meeting with uh, Dr. Williams, the new superintendent of schools next week uh, to talk about how our College of Education and our other programs can partner with her so that we'll, we'll do a better job of serving all of our students and hopefully keeping them on a path uh, towards education and, and a better life. Uh, and so these are some of the things that, that we're doing uh, to play a part in making New Orleans the kind of city that all of us can be proud of. Lynette, Antigua, I don't know if y'all had anything to share on that. Yeah, I mean, the, the crime situation is definitely um, creating problems. And it's, um, I mean, I'm a born and raised New Orleanian. I, certainly care about it for our community writ large. Um, and then for our company, it's yet another traumatic stress on our employees. And so Dr. Ammons talked about their grief and trauma center and it, it has been, I mean, for students, for employees, for just community members, a very traumatic couple of years from dealing with the pandemic to now dealing with um, the current environment around public safety. We do have people who are uncomfortable going to certain job sites or going to um, meetings and to pursue a project. And we need to balance, you know, their mental health with the assignments we're giving them. And so it's just um, that stress in addition to their, the actual public safety aspect of it, which is real, um, there's also just the mental health impact of the immense stress it's putting people under, and especially if they're worried about their family members and starting to consider um, moving away. And in the same way that Suno is not able to get their top candidates, you know, if we're losing those who have the economic mobility option of going somewhere else, that's not going to be good for our city. Um, so community-wise, you know, it's one piece in terms of what's good for us. And as an employer, the the heightened um, attention needed to mental health are the two kind of areas where I'm seeing it. Yeah, and I would just sort of echo everything, you know, that, that I just heard. Um, public safety is definitely top of mind, not just for the small businesses. Um, you know, many of them, um, are having to like close when you have a physical location, they're closing a little earlier. Um, but part of what the Business Alliance does is business and industry attraction. 
Um, and so we're looking for industry and larger businesses who would, you know, want to come to New Orleans, you know, locate, um, you know, businesses here. Um, we bring site selectors around to look at different sites. And a big part of what we're hearing, you know, is people are concerned about public safety. Um, and that does make it very hard to recruit business and industry here. Um, so we have been working with many of the different organizations like um, downtown development district, you know, we're working with the city and the police department to sort of, you know, strategize about things that we can do. But, you know, we're advising, you know, our small businesses, what they can do to, you know, remain safe, to make sure they have enough insurance for theft losses and things like that. Um, but it, it certainly is top of mind. Um, and, you know, it's, it's on the minds of everybody here in the city. Antigua, I wanted to uh, change topics a little bit um, and ask you about the federal relief funding that um, now appears, uh, at least from the state level, to be heading towards um, tens of millions of dollars of capital projects. Um, we have the infrastructure bill um, that was just passed earlier this year um, that's a trillion dollars um, aimed at infrastructure and other types of, um, uh, other types of projects. Um, how does that change your planning? What do, what do you think those timelines look like for um, the projects, for the money moving through the federal government, which I know can take a long time, um, but I'd just be curious your thoughts as someone uh, and a, as an industry that um, will be building the things that the, this funding is, is supposed to be building. Yeah, so Landis is at our core a building contractor. So we're not doing typically roadways and stuff, though we certainly have examples of that, like the linear park at the convention center. Um, so what it means to us as a business is maybe yet more stress on the workforce and trade contractor availability, because um, we do share those trades with infrastructure, particularly um, roadways and civil work. Um, so as a specific to Landis, that's one place that, that we'll see impact and we need to keep an eye on it. On the flip side, opportunity wise, um, it means there's some secured funding for our industry. And, and even though it's geared in a different way than where our core business is, they're all the periphery projects that happen around that. It really comes back to as part of your question and something that um, I was alluding to earlier is already a problem is time to market or time to construction. So we are right now, one of our large projects is um, one of the final schools in the FEMA package for rebuilding the New Orleans public schools system. And we are you know, 17 years after Katrina. So these dollars do take a really long time to process through. Um, I'm hopeful that it won't be as long, kind of like Suno getting um, their nursing program up and running more quickly than would have been expected in previous times. One would hope that these federal dollars translate into projects um, more effectively, more efficiently than they have in the past. But it'll be it'll be a long process to actually deploy all these dollars. David. Um I wanted to ask you about the Hilton because you all have been the largest hotel in the city for a long time, sort of the leader in the convention industry, but the sector is changing. There's more competition now. The Four Seasons coming online, um, certainly short-term rentals pose some sort of a threat. How is that changing, you know, the nature of y'all's business or y'all planning specifically any major refurbishments or renovations? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I, you know, I, I think that the business is, is, is always changing and always evolving. The, the world is always moving. I think to a certain extent, a rising tide raises all boats in that as the the, the overall um, uh, market gets better, as the city gets strong, as we have more product to offer, uh, it makes the city more attractive. I, I think our desire is to make sure that anyone entering that business space does so in a legal manner. And, and, and I'll refer to the short-term rental as you talk about short-term rentals. Uh, we're all for short-term rentals. We, we don't have any issues with anyone coming to the market. I think that that's a business product uh, that consumers are looking for. That being said, um, there's about, oh, about 1,800 permits in the city of New Orleans, and there's about 7,000 short-term rentals. So clearly there's a disconnect between business operating 
legally and effectively and people outside, out, out, outside of the normal methods of business. And so we're advocates for the city and the city council of, of quite frankly, enforcing the ordinances that the city council passes and making sure that people are doing business in a fair and just way. It's, it's really unfortunate that some people, some mom and pops go out there and they, hey, it can be difficult to get permits from the, from the licensing of permit permits uh, here in the city. And so the people that do it right should not be penalized by the people doing it wrong. In general, yeah, we, we are, you know, we, we just celebrated our 45th anniversary this year. Um, Moon Landrieu uh, sadly passed this past week. Uh, the Times-Picayune showed a picture of Moon on the Wednesday paper cutting our ribbon at our grand opening ceremony uh, in 1977. And so to remain, uh, yes, we are the biggest, but to, to remain a, a strong um, um, business, you need to continue to invest. COVID really held us up. You know, there's no question about it. Um, what, what impacted, what was the impact on businesses almost the most was the hospitality business, really the meetings business. Uh, I, I do more group room nights than any other Hilton in the entire world. We're the biggest group hotel the company has. We're the biggest hotel in probably four states. And so uh, on March 22nd of 2020, my business went to zero. Um, and so that that's a tough thing to overcome. So we slowed down some of our, our renovation plans, but we're kicking them up. And you can't hear it. I, I've had them stop for a little bit, but there's like jackhammering and other noise going on in my lobby right now as we were fully back on steam 100 percent to really reinvigorate our product with our partners that's a, a complete renovation of all of our rooms meeting space uh, restaurants etc and so we're very excited to not only have 45 great years behind us but we're looking for 45 years more into the future and i think as i stated earlier the, the meetings and convention space uh, you know we're not quite back to normal but we're getting there very quickly and we're very excited about the future. And so you, you mentioned a few products that's opened um, recently, but there's more products coming to market. A, a AC Hotel, a Marriott product was just announced directly across the street from the convention center. And of course, there's ongoing talks of additional products in conjunction with the convention center to develop upriver. I mean, the, the there's obviously a lot of smart people recognizing that the city still has a lot of value and are willing to invest, uh, quite frankly, a lot of money uh, to continue to support not just our industry, but the city in general. So if you take off your, your Hilton hat and you're wearing your hat as, as the Industry Association president, this is a good thing. But for the Hilton in particular, you also see it as a good thing, the competition? Yes. I, I, I do. Uh, again, what, what people are looking for in, in our space, in the hospitality industry, is a vibrant community, a growing community, and for new and interesting things for them to do. And so as you're seeing uh, more development, that's positive. And, and it's not just hotel development, you're, you know, which we've added some cool product. You've talked about the Four Seasons, the Kempton and the Virgin, all really neat product that's been added to the market. That's one more layer. I'm not them. Like my my business niche is different than their niche, and the market needs it all. But we're also adding more and more product in the entertainment space. So when you look at you know the the, uh, the expansion, continued expansion of the World War II Museum, and they're soon to open new 4D uh, entertainment space, it's just great to continue to add uh, volume of of options to the city. And so the more investment in general in the city, the better it is, even for me at the Hilton. So there's talk of an upriver hotel, um, and that's not a bad thing. Hall J of the convention center is the furthest from my hotel. I'm right next to Hall A. Hall J has the least and lowest occupancy. Why? Because it's furthest from the city. And so that upriver development, the expansion of the convention center, the development of more entertainment hotel the uh, you know the expansion of the old um, uh, energy plant power plant that's up there bringing that area back into commerce is only a positive for us all. Uh, we're we're getting short on time, uh, and so I would like to go around to everyone and and um, give you an opportunity for closing thoughts or to bring up anything that um, that uh, you think we sh we didn't bring up or um, or anything of that nature. I'm going to start with Dr. Dr. Ammons. Um, 
I do want to hear about the fact that sports are coming back to Southern University. So tell us what's happening there um, after a pause uh, as y'all as y'all were writing some of the financial ship uh, financial ship that uh, Suno was facing a few years ago. Yes. Well, um, as, as we were going through the uh, financial and accreditation difficulties, one of the toughest decisions that I had to make as a university head was to suspend the athletic programs. And as you know, athletics bring such um, uh, attraction, interest uh, to the institution. And we had to suspend those for a couple of years. Well, uh, in a few weeks, we'll have men and women basketball back uh, on the campus. Uh, we have a three-year plan um, this time next year. Uh, men and women basketball will be joined by volleyball and men and women golf. And the year after, uh, we'll bring uh, track and field back, as well as uh, baseball and softball. And so we think that by, by doing this and with the uh, uh, long, long history of excellence in track and field, especially uh, at Suno, we think that we will have now this big window uh, within which people can see uh, our institution. But we're very excited about athletics coming back. Thanks. Uh, Antique? Yeah, I mean, we have our problems in New Orleans, right? And our industry has its, its challenges, but I was really grateful for a reminder um, this summer about so many of the really great things that are going on. And one of y'all alluded to it, there are a lot of smart people putting a lot of money into this city and they wouldn't be doing that if they didn't see the bright future that we have. And so I think it's important that those of us who are here and invested in and love the city remind ourselves of not just the problems that we have, not just the challenges that we have, but also the immense opportunity we have and the, the beautiful foundation upon which we have to build. David? Yeah, I, I agree absolutely with, with, with Antigua. You know, I, I think that there's just the, the great thing about what we're seeing coming out of, of COVID is uh, getting back to being what's great about New Orleans is being with each other, uh, celebrating fairs, festivals, restaurants, music, uh, entertainment. I, I'm just so excited, quite frankly, to being what we are um, and being New Orleans again. So it's a very exciting time. Lynette, last word to you. Oh, well, um, we still live in the greatest city in the world. Um, and there is still opportunity. I think it's, it's a great time for small businesses right now. We're starting more businesses than ever before, minorities and women. Um, and it's really an exciting time. Despite all of the issues, despite the problems, we still live in the greatest city in the world. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this morning. It was a great conversation. I am hopeful that our viewers and our readers and our listeners learned a lot um, so thank you to AARP, who is our sponsor. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, as uh, my co-moderator on this. And thank you all. Have a good day.